Hi there. Um, first off, I just wanted to say welcome to Anatomy and Physiology. Um, my name is uh, Mr. Aaron Mullally, and I will be teaching you this subject as, um, as the semester progresses, obviously. Um, but, um, but yeah, I just want to say welcome. I'm glad you all are here, and I just want this to be a good, informative learning experience for you. So basically, I'm creating this video just to kind of give you some advice as um, whether you're a new, whether you're a new student to the subject or you're new to having me as an instructor um, or you know, both, uh, you know, there's just some kind of some key points to kind of take in and think about in terms of your approach to how you study the human body. So we'll just kind of talk a little bit about the subject itself and then ways to think about the subject, tips for studying, and then we'll just kind of, you know, wrap it all up. So, so anatomy and physiology, I don't want to get too in-depth with this just because um, this is kind of a key part of chapter one as well. Just the, just the key differences between anatomy and physiology, but anatomy is essentially the study of structure. Physiology is the study of function, okay? So then you have to ask yourself, all right, well, how in the world do I study structure? Well, that's a lot easier to think about because you basically do so via um, observation. You know, you can do so through palpation, you know, just touching things, um, you know, feeling the tissues, feeling the structure, um, you know, using your fingertips to assess a patient. Um, you're hopefully not going to be dissecting patients, but in class, we will be dissecting various organs uh, just so you can see the internal, you know, not just the external, but the internal makeup of various organs uh, to understand their function. And then we'll also probably be using, well, not probably, we will be using microscopes as well. So in a nutshell, anatomy is very visual. Okay, so if you're a very, very visual, tactile, hands-on learner, anatomy is just going to, it will fall right into place for you. You just have to put in the time and the effort to make it fall into place. Because obviously, as you know, this is a very dense subject, a very dense topic with a lot of information to take in and understand. All right, so if you don't put in the time, well, it's like any other topic, you're not going to do well. All right, but like I said, anatomy really lends itself to people who are very visual type learners. So use that to your strength. If you know that that's you, use that, okay? Um, physiology, on the other hand, is the study of function, all right? So basically, um, anatomy is the study of parts. Physiology is the study of how do the parts work, all right? And basically, how do we think about this or how do we study it? experimentation all right we're not going to be conducting any scientific experiments in class but we will be reading papers and articles and taking uh, information from uh, various experiments I mean when you have when you have this textbook sitting in front of you I mean where do you think most of the physiology knowledge in here came from it came from uh, you know, people who ran experiments and changed information over time. And that's the cool thing about this topic as well. Anatomy doesn't really change that much anymore. Um, obviously, it did kind of, you know, when, we, when microscopes first got, uh, when we discovered microscopes can be used for more than doing thread counts for textile merchants, um, we saw that I mean, we can do a lot with that, uh, with anatomy and understand cells, biology, when, DNA, when the structure of DNA was discovered. And we learned a lot more about molecular biology. That changed a lot about anatomy and physiology. All right, but this day and age, I mean, we're, we're kind of to the point now where I can't really think of, there really aren't many, there really aren't any really different ways to describe the shape of the skull or, you know, the bones in the arm and so on. With physiology, however, this stuff changes on a pretty regular basis. All right, and unfortunately nowadays, I think a lot of that is due to um, you know, as you get more advanced in the area of medicine, you learn that pharmaceutical, um, don't get me wrong, I'm not anti-pills or anything like that, but you'll notice that pharmaceuticals carry a very large influence in, in physiology and the functionality of uh, medications and so on. All right, but, um, but yeah, so experimentation um, and then observation, you obviously have to make observations of experiments that if you're a scientist that you're running, you have to look at how other people have done things. Because, for example, um, Claudius Galen was an old, 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 old Roman gladiator doctor. Obviously, he was old if he was alive during the times of the gladiator. And during those times, during Claudius Galen's times, um, 
it was illegal to perform dissections on cadavers. Uh, and the reason for it was because, which was a little unethical if you ask me, was because a lot of medical dissections were done on alive people. You know, basically, they were done on slaves in the, during the Roman Empire. And Rome finally understood the concept of ethics and said, well, no, that's bad. Um, but they just decided to get rid of dissections on humans altogether. So Claudius Galen, uh, he had to do a lot of comparative anatomy and study, you know, a lot of what we knew about anatomy for up until about the 19th century came from Claudius Galen, but he studied monkeys and pigs and other animals. And he had a lot wrong. A lot of his knowledge was incorrect, especially about the circulatory system until, wasn't really until, um, uh, oh, Harvey, if I want to remember correctly. Harvey or, fuck, Harvey. Yeah, no, William Harvey, I think. Anyway, um, so another physiologist came along and, because Claudius Galen said that, that the heart created blood, and then when blood went bad, it went to the liver, and the liver kind of recycled it, and then it was kind of a cycle. And if you were, it was believed that if you were sick, they, you know, you would make cuts on a person and get rid of that bad blood because you weren't recycling that blood like you were supposed to, and that was what bloodletting was. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people died because they were literally bled to death just to try to cure the common cold and many other things. So that's bad. And then Harvey came around and said, no, the, circula the heart does not create blood. It just circulates blood, pumps blood. And then he correctly described the circulatory system. And then later on after that, we found out that red bone marrow makes blood cells and so on. Okay, so he observed the errors in Galen's ways um, and correctly, you know, and, and, you know, corrected all this. Okay, so there's a lot of reading, a lot of logical thinking involved in physiology because physiology is a very step-by-step -step process. As you see, as we, even as we go through chapter one, as, uh, you know, one of the final discussions we'll have is on the topic of homeostasis and, and talking about basically, um, excuse me, uh, uh, just basically talking about uh, blah, 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 blah. oh the the process of maintaining balance in the human body. All right, the process of you know what do we do when our body temperature gets too high or too low? What do we do when our blood sugar levels get too high and too low, and so on? It's a very very systematic process. So the nice thing about systematic processes is that they're very step by step by step progression. So that's where the logical thinking comes in. A lot of times you can predict the next step while you're studying or learning this stuff just by using a little bit of logic and in intuition. So that's really anatomy and physiology. And like I said, we'll dive into this a lot more in detail later on. Um, but what's really cool about anatomy and physiology is that, um, is that Right now, you take a look at this. You know, looking at that, that's a heart. What else can you tell me about it? What does the heart do? What are the parts of the heart that allow it to do what it does? I mean, can you look at this and say, oh, my goodness, there's the aorta. Good gravy. There's the superior vena cava. Holy mackerel. There's the apex of the heart. Well, what do you know? Here's the chordae tendine of the heart. Well, look at these things right here. Those are the pulmonary veins. Hey, look, there's the left atrium. Hey, here's the right atrium. Well, what do you know? Both of these down here are what we refer to as ventricles. Hey, there's that infamous myocardium. You guys are probably sitting here watching this video going, what language is this guy speaking? All right. But that's basically... This is how you're going to be by the time you're done learning this. You'll be able to take a look at this picture of the heart and be like, hey, I remember learning about the tricuspid valve. Well, let's think about that for a second. Tricuspid. Tri means three. Well, what do you know? One, two, three cusps. Oh, there's three cusps right there. And this looks like a valve. Okay. So great, we identified the tricuspid valve. That was anatomy right there. All right, well, what the heck does the thing do? Well, when blood first enters the heart, it enters these upper chambers called the atria. And then these valves open, blood flows down into these ventricles. And when these lower chambers, the ventricles fill up, blood gets pumped out of the heart, all right, either to the body through the 
Um, I say it through that incorrectly. Either out the body through the left ventricle, through the aorta, or up into the lungs through the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary arteries. But we don't want blood to go backwards, back the direction it came. So as blood is, is being ejected up and out, these valves close. Um, all right, these valves close and prevent blood from going backwards, you know, in the, in the direction it's not supposed to go. Because th that's what a valve does. And whether you're talking about physics, mechanics, you know, engineering, or the human body, valves promote one-way flow by preventing back flow. Okay. Well, like I said, I'm not expecting you to watch this video or to walk away just reciting all of this verbatim, but you get the picture. This is how you learn anatomy and physiology. You can't understand or appreciate the functionality of the heart and how it works as a pump without understanding all of the parts of the heart first. By the time you're done with me, you're going you're gonna to be able to look at that and be like, oh, bam, there are the atria, bam, there are the valves, bam, there are the ventricles. Hopefully you don't say bam before that every time, but you get the picture. All right, but that's essentially anatomy and physiology, identifying the parts and correlating them with the functions, okay? So when it comes to approaching or studying a and P, I mean, first and foremost, have a positive outlook on it. Don't walk in here thinking, oh, my gosh, this is so hard. I'm never going to get this, blah, 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 playing a violin while you're doing all the complaining uh, and so on. You know, don't sing a sad song when you're when you're going through this stuff. There will be times when this subject will be frustrating. Don't get me wrong. When I was a student, I absolutely hated the respiratory system. I probably didn't really understand the respiratory system all that well until I had to start teaching. I always understood it well enough for myself to understand, barely. But I never really understood it well enough to really teach other people. So when I got into the career of teaching... I really had to, to hunker down and just make that system make sense and to create good examples of that. And I, I spend hours studying and thinking about that. All right, you're going to run into roadblocks. All right, now, I, now I'm confident in my knowledge of the respiratory system, but when I first started teaching, I was not. All right, but be positive. No matter what roadblock you hit, all right, be positive. All right, don't be afraid to ask for help. All right, don't be afraid to ask questions. If you don't ask questions, whether it's with your peers, whether it's you ask me, whether you ask a tutor, all right, if you don't ask questions, you're going to, and, and you're not going to get the material. If you don't get it, you, it you, it's, it's, it's just going to get frustrating and you're going to become negative. Don't do that. That's a slippery slope because being negative breeds negative results. And, and academically, negative results are bad. Okay. Excuse me. Have an open mind. Okay, be positive and have an open mind. We're going to talk about some topics that may be a little controversial or interesting to you. Um, be a critical thinker. Okay, be a critical thinker. Okay, I will throw the word evolution out there. Okay, me personally, I believe in God. I'm not, you know, I'm not an atheist, nothing like that. But I also know that evolution is a process that occurs, okay? I know that evolution is a what, but isn't necessarily a why. Now, there are some people that think very extremely on both sides of that topic, okay? I don't want that out of any of my students. I want people to have an open-minded approach towards things, to be a critical thinker, to evaluate information, and then formulate your own ideas, based off of, you know, thinking like that, okay? And when you do that, that allows you to be practical, okay? That allows you to be practical. Do not set lofty goals for yourself. Make sure they're realistic. Budget out your time. Make time to study, okay? Do not, this is not a good class to take when you, if you want to overload yourself with courses, okay? I'll tell you that right now. Because you're going to have to put in a lot of time and effort in studying this material, okay? I mean, there are some people where their stuff just, this stuff just makes sense no matter what they do very easily. 
that's a minority of the population. Okay, I was one of those people. I had to work my tail end off to make this stuff make sense. Okay, so make sure you're practical and you can actually allot the proper amount of time to to do well in this class and stay on track. Do not procrastinate. I know I'm saying that to college students. I was one a college student once myself, but I know the dangers of procrastination. Okay, do not do that. All right. Stay on track. I don't give you folks very much homework. Okay. We take, you know, as you know, we take tests on a weekly or quizzes, I should say, on a weekly basis instead. So you should be spending your time studying. You should be spending your, and if, and if, if whatever you're studying doesn't make sense, then you should be spending your time asking questions, obviously emailing me with questions. Okay. But be diligent and stay on track. Now, when you do have to ask a question, especially outside of class, Think about your question first. Don't just throw up a wall and get scared if, if you look at something that doesn't make sense right away. Think about it. Process it. Try to make it make sense first. And then if you just cannot do that, and there, I, I, I was a student once. There were times where I couldn't do that myself. There will probably be times and you won't be able to do that yourself on certain topics either. That's fine. Okay. But don't just make that your knee-jerk reaction to ask a question immediately. Okay, because nine times out of ten, what I'll do is I will answer your question with questions. I will say, okay, well, what do you know about this? And nine, nine out of ten times, I, you know, this is a lot easier to do in person than over via email. But nine out of ten times, I'll just ask, I'll just, I'll just ask questions to that person. I'll make them explain to me what they know, and they'll literally answer their own questions for them, because they knew the material. A lot of times, you know the material, but you, you, you know, you got to be confident in what you know as well. And that's really, really key. Okay. I mean, again, I'm not saying I, I don't want to dissuade people from asking questions. You should ask questions. Do not be afraid to do so. Okay. But make sure you think that. Make sure you think out the answer first, or you think about the information more first. And like I said, do not make asking questions just a knee-jerk reaction. And make sure your questions are also on track with what we're talking about as well, especially in class. Um, don't get me wrong. I love having discussions. I love answering questions. But it's really easy when your wheels get turning to kind of start shooting in directions that take us off the path we need to be walking down. So if you do have a question that's very off topic, um, save it for kind of like if we take a break or after class or before class so we don't derail, you know, our class time. And because, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of time to work with in class. So we have to make sure we're staying on track. So like I said, I want you to ask questions, um, but if they're kind of off topic, like I said, you know, you know, after class is a good time to do that or before, you know what I mean. So, and then the last kind of main thing I want to talk about is just kind of some advice when it comes to studying. Do not do the cram session thing. Take it from me. Uh, that did not work well at all. It's, I mean, it's, studies have shown this. I have, you know, my own personal experience shows this. If you wait till the last second and try to just ram everything into your head, it's not going to make sense. What you're going to wind up doing is you might, you might, you know, do well on the test. You know, if you wait, if you're busy or you wait or, you, or whatever the reason why, if you cram all that information in your brain the night before the test and you turn around to get an A on that test, did you really learn anything? No, what you really did was you just packed a bunch of information in your brain, you regurgitated it. But did you have a lot of time to process that information, to connect the dots, to link the information together, to build on it? No. All you did was you just binged and purged information. All right. So spread your time out. Like even if it's only an hour a day studying for the class. I mean, I'd recommend about two hours if you got it. But of course, I know my class isn't the only one that you're taking. You probably have to maybe cut it down to an hour a day. But if you did that six days a week, maybe gave yourself a day off. That would be that that that's far better than just waiting until the the two a day or two before the test and just trying to ram it all into your head because then you can not only put the information in your head but you can start to synthesize and put it together. Okay. Now the cool part about about a topic like this is you don't necessarily have to use your book. Your book is a useful resource. It's a useful tool, but it's not your only form of information. I mean, I will be putting many lecture videos up for you to watch. There are plenty of other people that have lecture videos like on YouTube, for example, like Campbell Teaching. He's a physician from England who um, creates anatomy, basic anatomy and physiology lecture videos. He's a very good teacher. 
the way he explains it might be better than the way I explain it for you. I mean, and if that works, great, do it. I mean, I, I mean, you know, you utilize that that resource. But when you're using the internet, be careful because there's a lot of boneheads out there that don't know what the heck they're talking about. Wikipedia. I'm not cool with y'all using Wikipedia. Wikipedia is not a terrible site. The problem is, is, is there's a lot of information on Wikipedia, and there aren't many people that regulate the information on there. So it's hard for them to get around and make sure all of the info on there is correct. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Most of your .com websites are going to be iffy at best all right, when it comes to A&P information. So that's something to keep in mind. If you ever run into a website that you're curious about, um, that you're a little leery about, just email it to me, and I'll I can usually within a minute I can tell you if that website's legit or not. So, all right. So be organized, establish a schedule and a routine, and don't be afraid to ask questions. All right, and make sure you come to class as well. I mean, because this class. Uh, you know, most most classes on campus here, if you miss five of them, you are withdrawn from the class. Being that this is a four credit class, if you miss four, you are removed, okay? Um, just due to the amount of contact hours we have in this class, so it's a little more strict. All right, plus if you miss a day, I mean, that's it, you miss a lot of information, okay? So make sure you are organized, you establish a plan of attack, you set, you know, you set normal goals, and you do what you can to achieve them, and you utilize me like I said, don't be afraid to utilize me as a, as a source of help. And then figure out your learning style as well. What I mean by that is um, what I mean by that is make sure that you um, you know if you're a very visual learner, don't be afraid to use use pictures. If you're very tactile, do a lot of drawing. Just make sure just figure out what works for you and then use that to your strength. All right. So that's basically how to do well in anatomy and physiology. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know.